the, the results of the semifinals. And the final round will obviously be in here. Uh, if we have enough of a point to look, we'll have the teams come up with that in just a minute. Uh, this was, I mean, these ballots with the sizzling and what they were saying on them and the scores were amazing. Uh, like I said, these were four regional champions that were competing in the semifinals. In the round between Team 102, Regent University, and Team 105, Morehouse College, advancing is Team 105, Morehouse College. <laughs> Congratulations, but also uh, in, in honor of the outstanding tournament uh, from Regent University. We were the 2014 Mid Atlantic Regional Champions. Okay, in the round between Team uh, 110, Patrick Henry College, and Team 107, which region did you guys win? Was it South Central or South Texas? South Central. So it was the one in Lubbock? No, no, okay. Good. So there was one down in a and okay. okay, so the re regional champions of the South uh, Texas region and the Eastern region. Uh, in a 2-1 decision, advancing is Team 110. Patrick Henry College, please have a round. <laughs> You might be seated. <clears throat> Petitioners, you want to rise and introduce yourselves to the court, please? Thank you. Respondent, will you please rise and introduce yourself to the court? Yes, Your Honor. My name is Claire Rossell, and I will be addressing the 14th Amendment issue. Your Honor, my name is Ben Williamson, addressing the First Amendment issue. Thank you. Thank you. You'll be seated. Who's the, who's the timer? Right here. Which one? Okay. Mr. Waddell, you might proceed. Your Honor, before you proceed, we ask to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. How many? Three. Fine. Mr. Chief Justice, fellow justices, and may it please the court. Good evening. My name is Emmanuel Waddell, and I, along with my co-counsel, Mr. Roger Malcolm, would be representing the petitioners, Ms. Andrea Somerville and Dr. William Denolf, in the case at bar. Later, Mr. Malcolm will be addressing the First Amendment challenge, for now, I would like to direct the court to the issue of Ms. Somerville's 14th Amendment rights. 
Specifically, we ask this court to reverse the ruling of the lower court, and to that we give three reasons. First, Proposition 417 mandates an unnecessary and invasive medical procedure. Second, Proposition 417 unconstitutionally restricts women's access to information. And third, Proposition 417 places unwarranted barriers in the path of a woman seeking an abortion. Proposition 417 places five barriers in the path of any woman seeking an abortion in the state of Olympus. These barriers, the transvaginal ultrasound, the fact that women are restricted to one script of information, the fact that they must call the Department of Public Health to gain more information about that script, the fact that they must go to the same doctor for both the ultrasound procedure and the abortion, and the fact that the state of Olympus prohibits private insurance providers from paying, forcing women to pay out of Why pocket. Why is that so significant? The fact that it, it, it doesn't allow private insurance uh, carriers to pay for that. Why is that significant to you? Well, Your Honor, that can make the cost of an abortion prohibitive. Because a transvaginal ultrasound procedure is required in order to receive an abortion, if a woman cannot afford to pay out of pocket for the transvaginal ultrasound procedure, the opportunity for an abortion is essentially closed off to her. Similarly, the state, this is also unacceptable because the state is using its regulatory authority to compel all private insurance providers in the state of Olympus to share its stance regarding abortion. Well, but, but haven't we already said that um, a, a limitation on a woman's ability to pay for the abortion itself doesn't violate the 14th Amendment. Um, so why would a limitation on this um, preceding proceeding be subject to a different analysis? Well, Your Honor, because as I stated, it compels private insurance providers to share the state's ab regulate, to share the state's- I don't think they're objecting to not pay. I mean, do you know an insurance company that's like, oh, oh, ooh, ooh let me pay? Y yes, Your Honor, if an insurance company is in the business of paying for its, um, its client's medical procedures, then it stands to reason that it may want to pay for this medical procedure. But isn't this elective? Yes, Your Honor. Although and I don't know in a single insurance company under the sun that insures elective procedures. So what your position is is we're uh, invading the rights of insurance companies to pay claims, as I understand it, something that no one does. Is that your position? No, Your Honor. Well, Nesson, the, and also we have to understand the transvaginal ultrasound procedure itself is not necessarily an elective procedure. The woman is attempting to undergo an abortion, and she's being compelled to undergo the transvaginal ultrasound prior to receiving that abortion. She's compelled to undergo this procedure. Similarly, the fact that she's, the fact that she's compelled to undergo it of, when combined with other burdens rises to the level of cumulative burden to answer Justice's question. Even if we can concede that maybe not this specific precision of raising the cost of the abortion itself is itself not an undue burden. When considered cumulatively with the other burdens that all women are forced to go through, we have to understand that this goes far beyond any case law that this court has ever hold, and therefore must rise to the level of substantial obstacle of any woman seeking an abortion. But an ultrasound's a pretty um, run-of-the-mill procedure with pregnancies. So a woman who's pregnant and is uh, not planning on terminating pregnancy would undergo probably a significant number of of ultrasounds. Um, so clearly, it, it, the medical establishment recognizes it as being part of the, of, of the medical treatment of pregnancy. So why, sh what, so why, is, why should this be different? Well, or why has it become an unconstitutional burden in doing it here? Yes, Your Honor. As this court noted in Stenberg v. Carhartt, appropriate medical judgment must embody the judicial need to tolerate responsible differences of medical opinion. This is relevant because the transabdominal ultrasound is also an option for women attempting to receive an abortion. But does that achieve the state interest? In other words, are you saying that a, an abdominal ultrasound can accomplish the same thing as a transvaginal ultrasound? Yes, Your Honor. As exactly the, the same thing? No, Your Honor. So as the addendum to the record notes, a transvaginal ultrasound may provide a clearer image. However, the clarity of the image is not, re is not medically relevant to the woman's decision, given that this court noted that tests for viability are acceptable only when viability is possible. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. The image is important, isn't it? Aren't we showing it to her? And in fact, she's not even allowed to avert her eyes from it? Yes, Your Honor. So isn't the clarity of the image part of the state's objective? Well, Your Honor, the clarity is irrelevant because the clarity conveys no new information that a transabdominal ultrasound would not convey. The record does not state this, merely that the information is clear. Is that true for, like, a, say, a six or eight or ten week old fetus? I thought part of the issue was that a transabdominal ultrasound at that young an age of gestation is ineffective. It doesn't show anything. So only a transvaginal ultrasound will show something. But, but I think the point is, the, the point that the just, of the justice's question was, 
was the state's interest is in giving information to the patient. That information includes a clear image of what the fetus looks like. So the clarity does matter. Well, Your Honor, the clarity does not provide any new information to the woman. It provides no medically relevant information to her as she is aware that she has a living fetus inside her. She's aware that these are attempting to abort this living fetus. The fact that the state compels all women to undergo this procedure will also- But you have to recognize that there's a difference between the theory of having a fetus inside you and the picture, which is the reality. Yeah. Yes, that, Your Honor. Isn't that the state's objective by having this very clear picture? Yes, Your Honor. And it is acceptable for the state to compel some sort of pre-abortion counseling, as is court upheld in Casey, but mandating this invasive form of pre-abortion counseling that can clearly be burdensome to some women who wish not to undergo this procedure. And how is that invasive? I, I don't understand that. I, why is it invasive? Well, as the addendum to the record notes, Your Honor, women are forced to undress and have the probe inserted in them for the maximum of an hour. This goes far beyond any um, sort of invasive procedure that this court has upheld in other abortion rulings, and maybe something that the woman certainly has no desire to undergo for various reasons. But the state can invade a person's body. We've determined that many times. We, we allow it for blood testing. We allow it for inoculation of small children at school, state mandated. So I don't understand your concern about this invasive. The issue here is that a woman is attempting to undergo a procedure, and this invasiveness does not sufficiently further a compelling state interest in a way that does make it makes it acceptable. But you can see the state has a compelling interest. Yes, Your Honor, the state does have a compelling okay, interest. And why doesn't it further that? It doesn't further that interest because of the lack of new information that I was discussing earlier. Because the state's interests here are only in protecting the health of the mother or the life of the unborn. We can reasonably accept that the state is attempting to protect the health of the mother in this instance, but in that case, if the doctor reasonably ascertains that a transvaginal ultrasound is unnecessary and a transabdominal ultrasound will convey for him and the mother all relevant information. Does a, does a state interest stop when the child, when the, after, before the, after the abortion is done? I'm sorry, Your Honor? Does the, does the interest stop once the abortion is performed? In, 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 and looking out for the health of the mother. Uh, I see my time is about to expire. May I answer your question and conclude? Okay. No, the, so the interest in protecting the health of the mother, Your Honor, would not stop after the abortion, but the Isn't question- Isn't that the purpose of this particular statute? The purpose of this particular statute only applies to pre-abortion women who are attempting to uh, receive an abortion, so is relevant to pre-abortion women. And so that would be the women that we're concerned with in this instance, those women whose conduct the regulation affects. For these reasons, we ask this court to reverse the ruling of the lower court and deem Proposition 417 unconstitutional. Thank you. Mr. Malcolm, you may proceed. Mr. Chief Justice, Associate Justices, Respondent, may it please the Court. My name is Roger Malcolm, I represent the petitioner Dr. William Benolf in the case at bar. We ask the Court to reverse the ruling of the 14th Circuit for three reasons. The compelled speech from four, Prop 417 is not commercial speech and therefore appropriate tests of strict scrutiny ought to be applied for aspects of it. Secondly, at the purported level of professional regulation, Prop 417 still unconstitutionally prohibits doctors from responding to questions. And thirdly, at the lowest possible bar of intermediate scrutiny, Prop 417 still fails the last two prongs of the Central Hudson Test. To my first argument, but why, brief. Yeah, why is this not commercial speech? Your Honor, it's not commercial speech because we understand commercial speech to be speech as defined by Central Hudson versus PSC 1980, speech solely related to the economic interest of the speaker and his audience. This is not, Your Honor in that the script provided by Prop, commanded by Prop 417 goes beyond the economic interest of Dr. Denolf by forcing him to extol the virtues of parenthood to Andrea Somerville and all of his victims. We understand economic activity as defined by the case law to relatively relate to commerce and also advertising um, to a captive audience en masse. In this situation, family planning, risk, a, a purported risk of a medical procedure, and the virtues of parenthood go way beyond but that. I think we're going away from the main point, which abortion in itself is a, is a commercial procedure, right? And, and in the state of Olympus, you know, is an abortion treated as commercial? 
Yes, Your Honor. Abortion is certainly a commercial. So if this is regulating abortion and speech regarding abortion, why isn't the speech commercial? Two responses, Your Honor. Firstly, that abortion is a commercial exercise does not render everything physicians say within clinics commercial. And then secondly, to draw an analogy, schools all the time advertise degree programs, research programs. It doesn't transform the nature of speech in classrooms or in research to be commercial speech. We concede that Dr. Dinov's advertisement of abortion services is perfectly commercial speech and regulated as such, but extolling the virtues of parenthood as compelled by Prop 417 is not commercial speech. And let's, let's say that I'm, willing, I'm not willing to concede that it is commercial. Can you win the case under an intermediate scrutiny test if we apply it as commercial speech or we deem the speech to be commercial? Certainly, Your Honor. To my third argument of commercial speech, we understand the test of intermediate scrutiny articulated in Central Hudson versus PSC to be three-pronged. One, the state must have a substantial interest. We openly concede that. Secondly, the action must directly advance that interest. And thirdly, it must be narrowly tailored. Prop 417 fails the last two prongs of this test. Um, Central Hudson states, quote, that the restriction must directly advance the state interest. The regulation may not be sustained if it only provides ineffective or remote support. Prop 417, by placing a prohibition on what doctors can say in response to direct questions about the studies quoted in the script, doesn't further the purported interest of informed consent. Andrea Somerville had a question if she would contract breast cancer from having an abortion, as the state purports to increase risk to do so. Dr. Dinov could not answer that question under Prop 417, particularly page 17 of the record, Appendix 3, Rule 3, which says no physician licensed in the state of Olympus, not only, physician, not only abortion providers, but any doctor, can pass critiques, give judgments, or respond to the studies articulated in the pamphlet. Doctors can't give advice, be it personal, medical, or otherwise, on the legality of the but law. Isn't Dinov wrong here? I mean, he can say whether or not there was breast cancer, true? No, Your Honor. Dr. Dinoff was wrong in thinking he couldn't refer an oncologist, but he was correct when he couldn't refer, he couldn't pass judgment or answer any questions regarding the studies. The question was, am I going to get breast cancer, right? Yes, Your Honor. The study doesn't say one way or the other? No, Your Honor. The study, the stu the Mr. Dis Ms. Somerville asked a question in response to the purported risk of in increased risk of contracting breast cancer by procuring an abortion. So Dr. the question wasn't answered in the study, so Denolf could have answered. No, Your Honor, he couldn't. Because as Prop 417 says, um, physicians shall direct all inquiries to the State Department of Public Health regarding any inquiry about the nature of virtue or content of the studies. Insofar as Ms. Somerville had a direct question about the studies, and we think it's but very- is the absence of something in the study a question about the study? So she asks a question that is completely uncovered in the study. Um, can the doctor either answer it or refer it someplace other than the, the, the state? Conceivably, if a, if a patient asks a question that's nowhere in the study, we think doctors could answer it. Well, that's with the breast cancer question, because that wasn't covered. No, Your Honor. The study did speak about an increased risk of breast cancer. But we think that's very unlikely, in that the, study, the pamphlet and the script provided by the state are so encompassing from suicide, ha harm to family members, depression, breast cancer, and increased risk of hemorrhaging or even death, we think almost any medical question that patient could have would be implicated some way in the study. And therefore, this prohibition on what doctors can say violates the um, personal relationship between doctors and their patients. So it would violate the second prong of the Central Hudson test in that it's not narrowly tailored. It's a wide-ranging prohibition on what all physicians can say in the state of Olympus. But isn't, doesn't that further the state interest in ensuring uniformity? I think that's their intention of why they're having a script to read from so doctors can't deviate and insert their own personal views, which may or may not be scientific. And doesn't also, that's the first part of my question, <laughs> and doesn't also the law allow for the individual patient to receive information from the state regarding your question? Your Honor, two responses to the question. So first, regarding the interest of uniformity, which is not actually articulated by the state, and this court has held particularly, I believe it's a consul with Edison, that we should not interpret the inter intentions of the state, but use what the legislator has said. The interest is information, not uniformity. But even if it were to be uniformity, we'd then say this would violate the first prong and, and fly in the face of precedent, particularly the Kona v. Walt Walters, in which case the court held that the state couldn't prohibit physicians from suggesting marijuana and illegal substance of the federal law as potential therapeutic treatment, even though the state had an interest in doing so because the doctor-patient relationship was paramount. 
So under both scenarios, the state would violate some aspect of case law. And to the second part of your argument, Your Honor, which I'm unfortunately <coughs> forgetting, could you please repeat it? Um, I believe the second part was, doesn't she have an alternative to go to the state to get the information? Yes, Your Honor. So Angela Somerville should leave from a state script to a state source. That isn't an alternative, Your Honor, in that when she did that, she was directed to interest groups and ideological groups who supported Prop 417's passage. She isn't given access to alternative information. In fact, she had to leave the state to get it. We think this crosses the barrier, Your Honor. And to my second argument, that even if it is professional speech, if this court chooses to use the Florida Bar versus went for its standard and account society versus Bowman standard, it would still restrict what doctors can stay in an unconstitutional way. We look to Planned Parenthood versus. If, if, if we were in to interpret, if, if we were to find a constitutional problem with it regulating doctors other than the abortion <coughs> provider. So that she could go to an oncologist, let's say, to talk about to talk about the breast cancer issue. She just can't ask the doctor who's performing the ultrasound and, and is going to perform the the abortion. Does that alleviate the? Doesn't that alleviate the constitutional concern that you're addressing? Absolutely not, Why Your not? Honor. We looked at Planned Parenthood <coughs> versus Casey. We had a very similar situation of free abortion counseling and a script that was supposed to be provided. In Planned Parenthood v. Casey, the, the court allowed and we concede that the state can provide a message. But here are four important limitations. First, in Casey, doctors simply had to provide material to persons or let them know it was available. They didn't have to read the script in their own voice. Well, but I'm, but I'm, I'm going to stop you because your argument has been the burden on, on your client's speech is the fact that the patient can't go any place else to get it, and that's why the regulation doesn't further the interest. It doesn't further the interest and isn't narrowly tailored. Um, but but so I'm suggesting, well, if we alleviate that concern, we, we the patient can go someplace else. It's just the abortion provider that we're going to regulate. That alleviate that the, the specific concern you're addressing is alleviated there. Well, it may alleviate certain things on the 14th Amendment issue for Andrew Somerville, but it would not make the law narrowly tailored, in that doctors would still face a relatively blanket prohibition on anything that they can say in response. Only the abortion provider. Yes, Your Honor. So it would violate the First Amendment rights of the abortion provider, of which Mr. Denoff is. And therefore, especially in light of the fact that he's compelled to say something and is unable to respond, I mean, may I be briefly reconsidered, Your Honor? Yes, um, Chief Justice, my time has expired. May I briefly continue answering the question? Make it short. I will, Your Honor. The fact that he's compelled to say something is also not ideologically neutral, Your Honor, violates both compelled speech and restricted speech, which goes beyond the most factual similar case, which is Casey, where there was no prohibition. And for those reasons, under any standard the court chooses, Prop 417 will still fail. We urge the court to reverse. Thank you. Thank you. Responded? Ms. Roselle, you may proceed. <coughs> Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court, my name is Claire Rossell, and I, along with my co-counsel, Ben Williamson, represent the respondent, the state of Olympus, in the case at bar. I will be addressing the 14th Amendment issue, and my co-counsel will be addressing the First Amendment issue. I ask this court to affirm the ruling of the 14th Circuit and hold that Proposition 417 does not violate the 14th Amendment in the Constitution, and I ask this for two reasons. First. The state has a legitimate state interest in ensuring informed consent before the abortion procedure. And second, Proposition 417 advances its interest without imposing an undue burden. To address How is my the ultrasound informed consent? Aren't the pamphlets enough and that's been, help, that's been upheld in the, in the uh, Planned Parenthood? Your Honor, the pamphlets certainly help, but the state has an interest in ensuring full informed consent. And the best way to do that is to provide the woman with the most medically and scientifically up-to-date information that they can Showing do. a picture of the fetus, how is that informed consent? Because, Your Honor, the woman then understands that there's a child inside of her, that it's her child you inside You mean she doesn't understand there's a child inside of her now? She doesn't understand the full implications of her pregnancy until she sees the image of her own child. Why can't that be described verbally? Because, Your Honor, she can't actually interact with her own child. The state does can't interact with her own child. <laughs> all she's doing is looking at a all she's doing is looking at a picture. How is that interacting? Because, Your Honor, she's seeing the image of her own child and hearing it described. And can't you see the own image of an abdominal ultrasound? 
It's for some women, yes, but in Miss Somerville's specific situation, where she was in the first trimester of pregnancy, the transvaginal ultrasound procedure was the most effective method for the state to convey the message, showing her uh, the full image of her own child. But if it's being described, and that's already part of this, what, what more does the ultrasound add? It adds, once again, the personalization of her own child. This was recognized. In what way is it, what way is it personalized? Is, is just seeing something that much more powerful than hearing something? It certainly is, Your Honor. And specifically, Stewart versus Loomis noted that there was evidence provided by women who showed that the, seeing the image of their child uh, and led them to make a more informed decision and also referenced several studies which also agreed that women had a more rich and informed experience by seeing the ultrasound image. Could a blind woman? have a fully informed consent as she could to the best of her ability she could hear the heartbeat of the child but if, you know the, we're most interested in ensuring that the woman to the best of her ability have as much information as possible about her pregnancy and her decision can she, a blind woman have a procedure <coughs> for this scenario because she cannot avert her eyes you have to show that she actually saw it and if she's blind she cannot and therefore, she cannot have an abortion. Only blind women can't have abortions? No, Your Honor. It says that she can't avert her eyes, but if she's not able to see the image, then certainly common sense and a reasonable understanding of the statute would say that she could go forward with her abortion. But how is she fully, fully informed then? By, by your definition, by the state's definition, she cannot be fully informed. She's as informed as she can be. She's hearing the ultrasound image. Just what if she's blind? Let's, let's, let's take it to the extreme. She's, she, she is both visually and hearing impaired. She can't see the image. She can only, she can read the doctor's lips um, when he reads the script to her. Certainly, Your Honor. And in that case, she wouldn't be able to hear the, the right. image described or anything like so that. So is she fully informed? She'd be as informed as she possibly can be given her personal constraints. Well, and the state to tailor this then to meet every sort of situation where people have some kind of barrier to full understanding, mentally ill. They don't perceive the images the same as, quote unquote, uh, fully developed person. Well, correct, Your Honor. And the interest is ensuring that the woman is able to get as much inf information as she possibly can. And that's just the basic understanding in the statute. And certainly if a woman is blind or deaf, then obviously she won't be getting quite the full experience, but she'll be as informed as possible. The opposite, this, this the opposite of that, let's say uh, <coughs> herself is a physician and has a lot of sort of follow-up questions that she would need to make a fully informed consent for her own <coughs> individual understanding of the procedure. Could the doctor go beyond the script in that case to fully inform the already informed patient? Certainly, Your Honor. We actually reject petitioner's understanding of the statute to say that the doctor can't actually discuss the medical implications of her pregnancy or the abortion. Specifically, if you look at the title of Appendix 3, those limitations on the doctor are only placed during the performance of the transvaginal ultrasound itself. However, outside of that particular instance, the doctor is free to discuss with his patient whether or not uh, the abortion is a good idea or any of her medical particular issues. So what you're saying is that uh, in the room after the script is, uh, is uh, read, you can't, the doctor can't give her any advice. Once she steps out of the room and the with her, then at that point the doctor can give her advice. That Sir, doesn't make any sense to me. Your Honor, particularly there's an interest in ensuring that the state's message is moving forward without any interference from the doctor. Particularly it would be, for example, if we had a pamphlet which we were handing to a woman <clears throat> which showed the risks of an abortion, but we crossed out certain elements of that because we disagreed with it. It's ins we're ensuring that the, the purity of the state's message by essentially putting this protective bubble around the woman's discussion with her doctor during the performance of the transvaginal. Did you just say the purity of the state's message? Well, certainly, Your Honor, that there's no interference during. So your position is, is that the state speaks with purity, as I understand it, <coughs> and that no one can question the state anymore in this room. Is that true? Your Honor, by the purity of the message, I meant that there's no interference while the message is being conveyed. Essentially, that the entire message is being conveyed at one time to the but woman. But isn't that the problem, is that there is a purity of this message that the state commands be said 
that we cannot question the state in this room? That sounds rather ominous to me. It gets to the point, if I might pick up on my associate's comments, what is the state's interest? The message or the information being provided? Your Honor, the interest is that the woman understands the risks of abortion so that she can avoid potential regret and suffering from sorrow later on, as this court noted in Gonzalez versus Carhartt. Specifically, that a woman who comes to regret her decision would suffer from even more grief and even more sorrow than an informed consent process would provide to her. Why have the doctor read the, the script? Why just not hand it to her? Because, Your Honor, once again, it's ensuring that she actually hears it and doesn't just throw away the pamphlet. There's an interest in ensuring that even if she doesn't necessarily want to hear it, for example, in Gonzalez versus Carhartt, where the woman might not want to hear the description of the abortion being performed, the state has such a high interest in ensuring that she understands this information ahead of time. Is it the state's interest in this particular statute, the showing of the uh ultrasound, the, hear, the, the, the beating of the heart, the script from the doctor, is it, aren't all those three in totality to guilt a woman not to perform an abortion? No, Your Honor, but it was recognized in both Casey and Gonzalez that the state's interest in persuading a woman to have childbirth over abortion isn't unconstitutional. Instead, the state specifically has this interest of ensuring that a woman understands what she's doing when she walks into that room for an abortion. And this goes beyond Casey. <coughs> I'm not sure if Casey's on all fours here because um, certainly the 24-hour long problem with what, how would you use Casey to justify the ultrasound? Well, specifically, Casey set a basic precedent of what informed consent is which is that it's truthful, non-misleading, and relevant information. And as Texas Medical Providers versus Lakey noted, uh, Casey is not a ceiling for informed consent, but rather enunciates basically these principles that should be abided by with an informed consent procedure. But have we ever dealt with a, a compel, a, a, a com, an involuntary, invasive medical procedure like this? I mean, we're, 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 the state is requiring a woman to have an object placed in her, in her vagina without her consent. I mean, outside of a doctor's office, the term for that is sexual assault. Um, this seems to go beyond anything that we've ever seen before in the 14th Amendment context. No, Your Honor. In Webster specifically, amniocentesis is one method of testing the lung condition of the fetus. And this was mandated by the, by the state specifically. And the court noted that even though that was actually a risky procedure, it was invasive, and it wasn't standard medical practice, that the, court could, that the state could require this. And transvaginal ultrasound procedures are standard medical practice. They are safe for the woman. And therefore, this oh, no, is there's no question about safety. The question is one of voluntarism. Yes, sir. Um, there, there's lots of things that we do that are safe when the <clears throat> patient consents to it. Your Honor, I see my time has expired. May I briefly address his question? You may. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor, and once again, amniocentesis, which this court upheld in Webster, was an invasive procedure that the woman wasn't consenting to. But the state had an interest in ensuring that an, a child was not aborted post viability. And in a similar way, the state has an interest in this case, and therefore Proposition 417 is not unconstitutional. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Williamson, you can proceed. Mr. Chief Justice, your honors, may it please the court. My name is Ben Williamson, and I also represent the respondent, the state of Olympus, in today's case on the First Amendment issue. Now, I'll be asking this court to uphold the decision of the lower court and rule that the state of Olympus acted within its constitutional authority under the First Amendment by enforcing Proposition 417. To this end, I'll be offering the court two specific arguments for review. First, the speech required by Proposition 417 is commercial in nature and therefore subject to the intermediate scrutiny test laid out by this court in Central Hudson. And second, Proposition 417 passes the intermediate scrutiny test. Now, Your Honor, determine it's ideological speech. Because to me, it seems there is sort of an ideological component to even most of these. 
that you pass strict scrutiny? Absolutely, Your Honor. And first of all, respondent would disagree with the notion that this is ideological speech, because as this court noted in Carhartt and in Casey, just because the state gives one side of the risks involved with an abortion, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's ideological in nature. And furthermore, if we look at the information that the doctors are required to provide, none of them are affirmative statements that require a doctor to give an ideological message. Uh, for example, a script requiring a doctor to say that parenting can be a very rewarding experience or saying that you may suffer from guilt is not ideological. It's simply possibilities and disclosing medical fact that is that's proven. discussing a, it's a parenting value. Wouldn't that be ideological? No, Your Honor, because he's not saying parenting is a rewarding experience. He's just saying that medical studies and surveys have shown that in the past some women have regretted giving up that opportunity. And that's fact. But he in what, can way is it, what way is any of this commercial? Your Honor, it's commercial for two reasons. The first is what we find in the record is that both parties concede that they're involved in a commercial transaction of both Dr. Denolf and Ms. Somerville. And according to this court's ruling in Central Hudson, when a two parties have an economic interest, there is commercial speech Does involved. Does the New York Times engage in commercial speech when it publishes a newspaper? Your Honor, it engages in commercial speech when there is an economic interest so involved. So the New York, well, the New York Times sells its newspaper. So it publishes the newspaper and it sells it. So is the front page of the New York Times commercial speech? Uh, perhaps it could be, Your Honor, depending on what is on the front page of the newspaper, if it's an advertisement per se, as long as... USA, America attacked on, uh, on September 12th, on the headline on September 12, 2001. That's commercial speech subject to Central Hudson regulation. No, Your Honor, that would not What's be. the difference between that and talking about the science of abortion to a patient? Your Honor, because... <coughs> what's commercial. I mean, it's, there's a commercial transaction. We're selling the newspaper. Your Honor, what we're dealing with in this case specifically is an abortion doctor who provides abortion services. And the speech in question comes prior to the abortion. It's before Ms. Somerville goes through with the actual process. So informing her of the risks is before the transaction has taken place. Therefore, it is commercial speech combined with the fact that both parties concede that they're involved in a commercial enterprise. What about enterprise. his chilled speech here? What about the speech that he can't make after reading that pamphlet? Is that commercial speech? Uh, Your Honor, it is. And specifically for right. responding... The mandate that he cannot speak is commercial speech. Yes, Your Honor. It's a commercial restriction by the government. And if I may explain, I believe you're specifically referring to Rule 3 and Appendix 3, as found on page 17, which says that doctors cannot comment on the medical propriety of abortion or anything relating to the studies behind a Proposition 417. That specifically, Your Honors, deals with the transvaginal ultrasound of procedure itself. Right, that's about some, but that's about science. It's about the science behind the studies. That's scientific speech. Absolutely, Your Honor, and it's our contention today that at any time outside of the transvaginal ultrasound procedure, Dr. Denolf is more than permitted to go into the facts behind that. Okay, so, but if it's scientific speech, it can't be commercial speech. Well, Your Honor, if it's before the actual procedure takes place and it is commercial speech regulated by the doctors. Why? Because, Your Honor, we're dealing with an abortion doctor offering a service who then goes what about into... Uncharged? What's that? What about uncharged? What if the doctor doesn't charge? Your Honor, the economic interest could still be in play because the woman may be going to the doctor because she doesn't charge. The fact is, is that the state of Olympus calls an abortion service a commercial enterprise. And Com that's the end of it. If the state says it's commercial speech, it's commercial speech. Absolutely not, Your Honor, because we also see in this case that both parties concede they're involved in it as well. But it isn't just... But I, I, go, I, I guess I go back to my newspaper example. A newspaper is a commercial enterprise. It is publishing its words for the purposes of selling them and having people buy them. A TV station is in the process of, of producing its TV shows so that people will watch them and then advertisers will advertise and they will make money from that. A movie producer produces its movie hoping to make money from that. Are you arguing that any speech that somebody tries to sell or that is in or that is going to be sold is commercial? No, Your Honor, because the speech also has to be connected to a compelling state interest and also be truthful and non-misleading. Well, no, but we don't get to that if it's not commercial. Yes, Your Honor, but in order for it to be commercial to start with, it has to be both truthful and non-misleading. It can't just be any speech whatsoever. It okay, has to okay. be. Okay, so let me go back to the New York Times example, okay? New York Times has an editorial that says, 
you know what, all this uh, internet stuff, that's terrible, you should stay with printed newspaper. Commercial speech, right? That's his point of view in an op-ed piece. He's trying to sell newspapers. Can the state regulate that? Your Honor, once again, there's a distinction between a newspaper article and a professional enterprise that we're dealing with here in the context of a doctor's office. So is anything a lawyer says to, is, is, are, the, are you getting, you're, you're making money from the state. You're, you get a salary from the state, right? Indeed, for, Your Honor. For being their lawyer. Um, so is what you're doing right now commercial speech? No, Your Honor, Why it's not. not? Because you're getting paid for it. It's part of a commercial transaction. You're doing it on behalf of your client who is paying you. And they're compelling you what to say. Your Honor, well, well in dealing with my speech specifically, I have already agreed to represent counsel, and therefore it's not commercial speech because the transaction has taken place. If there, but were, in, if there were a uh, scientific study that demonstrated that there are particular psychological should this be included? Your, and if, and if, and if it should, why not? Your Honor, once again, we want to be very clear as the state about the restriction that we actually make on doctor's speech. Petitioner is correct that during the actual procedure of the transvaginal ultrasound, a doctor cannot comment on the medical studies. That's just as my co-counsel explained to make sure that the state's message gets through uninterrupted. But the state's but, message would, does not include psycho, theoretically scientific studies that demonstrate that in some cases abortions may have a profound positive psychological, economic, physical effect. Your Honor, and once again, the state isn't required to provide that information or at least mandate it. And the reason is because, as this court specifically held in Casey, when a doctor is compelled to give certain information, the state can only leave it to the actual risks associated. So but, it has but it has chosen to omit certain facts, and it has chosen to articulate certain other facts. That's a distinction. It's based on science. How is that not ideological? When the state is choosing certain facts and ignoring others that it allows the doctor to your Honor, this court actually addressed this very question in Casey when it said that just because a state requires a doctor to speak to the harms of abortion, that doesn't mean they're being one-sided or that they're being ideological. It just means that they're going to their interest of informing a woman about the risks involved. Now, it's supremely important that we clarify exactly what the state is not prohibiting doctors from doing. We are not in any way preventing a doctor from disagreeing with the state's message. At any time, Your Honors, before or even after the transvaginal ultrasound procedure, Dr. Denolf can give his medical advice on the state studies if he chooses to do so. But in this one moment, in this one room, in the bubble, as you all have called it, the virtue of the state's message must come through. True? Absolutely, Your Honor. The state's message has to come through in that moment. Unquestioned. Well, not unquestioned, Your Honor, because in he's- In that moment. In that moment, yes, Your Honor. He cannot comment on the validity- Why? Why, why can it not be questioned in that moment? Your Honor, because this court explicitly stated in Casey that so long as a doctor is permitted to question it outside of that one moment, it's still constitutional because a state does have the authority to make sure that their message is communicated uninterrupted. As my co-counsel stated, it would be like me giving you a pamphlet and crossing out certain statements in the pamphlet undermining the information I'm giving. Well, but, but there's a, there's a slightly different consideration here, and that is we also have to take in the First Amendment's compelled speech uh, context. So I guess, have we ever held that the mere fact that I can, that someone can make the opposite speech in another time and place alleviates the compelled speech argument? So the fact that, that Mr. Maynard could have said, no, don't live free or die, um, alleviated any First Amendment from concern from him having to display that on his license plate. Absolutely, Your Honor. The court has ruled on that twice, and I see my time has expired. May I answer your Ask question? Him. Mr. Chief Justice, may I answer the yeah. question? The court has ruled on that twice, both in Florida Bar and in Casey, that requiring a doctor or a physician or professional to say something is still constitutional so long as you allow that same individual to disagree or contradict the message outside of that one moment. In other words, requiring a doctor to give a state's message isn't ideological so long as he's permitted to disagree at another time. Your Honors, for that reason, we'd ask this court to affirm the lower court's ruling 
and rule in favor of respondent, the state of Olympus. Thank, Thank you, you, Your Honors. Mr. Malcolm, you may proceed with your rebuttal. Your Honors, by every Brussels, we assert the following. On the 14th Amendment issue, the provisions are still unduly burdensome. On the First Amendment issue, respondents make distinctions without a difference that re render the action still unconstitutional. To the 14th Amendment issue, the states we concede can persuade women to not have an abortion. They can't do that while placing substantial obstacles in women's way. Respondents fail to address the prohibition on private insurance, paying for the measure, and concede that they must tailor their actions to a state interest. Pro prohibiting private insurance from paying for it doesn't advance the state's interest of the health of the mother or the life of the unborn. It only advances an interest of coercion and places a real financial burden potentially for low-income women who would not be able to pay for this if private so insurance is covered. If they added a provision, let's say we struck on a law, gave them sort of an advisory opinion here, told them to add in that the state must pay for these procedures. You'd have no problem with the law besides that? We still have many problems, Your Honor. To the second point of rebuttal on the 14th Amendment, but the respondent claims that the in, uh, action is not invasive, the transvaginal ultrasound, by relying on Webster's amniocentesis ruling. But amniocentesis was only upheld in Webster as a viability test. But both sides concede in oral arguments that viability is not a question in the case at bar. And therefore, viability testing as upheld in Webster would be inapplicable here. Well, because but I don't think she was making the point about, she wasn't citing Webster for the point about viability. She was citing Webster for the point that the fact that a, a pre-abortion procedure is invasive doesn't af necessarily offend the 14th Amendment. Yes, Sir, and Webster's holding only applies insofar as that pre-abortion invasive procedure is a test for viability. No, but I think well, what he's saying is we've upheld similar measures which have intrusiveness. When there are tests for viability, Your Well, Honor. no, that's only because that's what happened to be at issue in, Web in Webster. Webster was, it, it was an only viability, it was, it's, a, it's analog I mean, it's analogous. The point is invasiveness by itself is not a problem. Your Honor, and we, we disagree with that, Your Honor. We think that it's best for the doctors to be able to decide if we need to transvaginal ultrasound or transdominal ultrasound, depending on the particular context of the woman due to that nature of the relationship. But on to the First Amendment rebuttal, Your Honor. We disagree entirely that doctors can say what they want outside of the bubble. We look very quickly to Appendix um, 3, page 17, that has six rules. The third rule is the only rule, Your Honor, that doesn't in begin with the quote, physicians administering transvaginal ultrasounds. It says, quote, physicians are licensed to practice medicine in Olympus, and it goes on to say what they cannot say. It's very telling that this is the only rule that doesn't reference transvaginal ultrasounds, because it's a blanket prohibition of what physicians generally can say. We urge the court to assess that very deeply, and it is not simply a bubble, which would fly in the face of the lower course ruling it is seeking this court to affirm. And for those, that's the court to reverse. Thank you. All right. Attorneys, attorneys, please step outside the room.